Hey everybody, welcome to this week's episode of the Darwin Bandits. It is an Oren only episode. Uh, the guys will be back soon. We have the live show come up this Thursday, so make sure you check that out as well. Uh, but this week, this Wednesday, we are so excited. We have our interview with Alex Grand. Uh, Alex is the man behind Comic Book Historians. It's a wonderful YouTube page, Facebook page. Uh, so much great information. Alex has taken the time through the years to interview the men and women who make the stories we love so much. He's kind of like the man who started all for, for guys like us. Uh, we're talking to him about his new book, Understanding uh, Comic Book Superheroes, which is coming out soon. Please, please be sure to check it out. Uh, I really love talking to Alex. He's a super uh, cool, wonderful guy who is a comic book fan just like us. And when you hear about the work and time he's putting into this upcoming book, it's really astounding, guys. So enough from me. Let's hear from Alex. I have Alex Grand from Comic Book Historians. Alex, thank you so much for taking the time. Yeah, well, thanks, Oren. Thanks for having me on. I'm a I'm an admirer of your work, and it's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, thank you so much. And we're big admirers of yours. You sort of set the stage for all of us with your oh, work. Oh, that's nice. Oh, that's um, kind of you to say. Thanks. Well, how how did comic books first get into your life? Um. Yeah. So I think uh, I was uh, four years old, and I got a He-Man action figure, 1981, and uh, uh, they came with mini comics, and I really loved those, and um, I think I realized that uh, comics are kind of a gateway to a whole nother imaginary world and you can follow them. They explain it for you. And if you have questions, they tend to answer them eventually. And um, for all the cool pictures you're looking at. And then after that, it was, uh, you know, 7-Eleven, you'd have the newsstand and they had, you know, um, you know, Power Man and Iron Fist and Marvel stuff, you know, Spider-Man and his amazing friends was, you know, 1983, I think. And that was, that was on the air and that was just, you know, the Incredible Hulk cartoon. So all that kind of mixed together and I kind of became probably more of a Marvel guy. I love Christopher Reeve's Superman, um, but I think DC came later for me. At what point did you tell yourself, I'm very curious about the people who are making these books and wanted to find out more about them? So that was after all my grad school stuff was finished and I, I was working and I didn't really have... Uh, anything academic to do. And then I started, you know, I was reading comics all the way through, but um, I think it was in 2005, 2014, where I was like, okay, I want to figure out this Jack Kirby, you know, Stan Lee thing exactly. And Steve Ditko and whatever else. And, and then that grows into, you know, Jim Steranko and Neil Adams and whatever, all the people that follow them, all the golden age stuff. And, you know, it, it, it's a whole world. I mean, you can never like know all of it, you know, and I, and I'm amazed with some people who I'm almost convinced they do, but no one realistically does um, know everything about it, but but I realized like this was this is almost like my new academic thing. Maybe I can kind of go that way, and and then uh, <clears throat> and so that just started the the Facebook and then the, the YouTube channel, and then after that, um, you know uh, what we we put to the podcast together to just more talk about stuff. That was more in the in the in the mold of the of the Facebook posts, the rules that I made for the group of have a year and have a, have a year and have a, you know, a topic uh, for that year. And, and then it just kind of, but then uh, my friend Bill, who was doing that with me back then, he came up with the idea of doing interviews. And then I realized like something started to click with me, like, Hey, you know, this is like a, you know, we, we could really ask some stuff and try to figure out who did what, what, you know, you don't have to rely on fandom, you know, you could kind of go right to the source. And then I think, when I went to Dallas Fantasy Fair, J. David Spurlock introduced me to Jim Steranko. And then that was like the beginning. That was probably the beginning for me of like, uh, you know, you can actually you could just ask these people, you know, what happened. You don't have to rely on third hand, second hand sources. And so that was that that Steranko interview really had a big influence on me. And and he he was also the reason why I, um, my friend Mike DeLisa recommended back in 2015 to read the Steranko history volumes. And after I read those, I was a changed man. I was I was never the same. And so Steranko was like a big interviewing him was part of like that whole thing. And uh, and luckily for the book uh, that's coming out next month uh, that I wrote, you know, he wrote the forward and he was really kind enough to to do that. And um, what a, what a guy. I mean, he you know, he he just really um, made me he, he just really influenced a lot of uh, of how I approach all this. Um, so that was pretty cool. And then and then in his forward, it was pretty awesome. Like the last line in his forward mm -hmm. says uh, this uh, 
the American superhero deserves to be remembered and studied. Um, and, uh, and that, uh, tradition, um, continues in this volume, which was like a really cool way he, he phrased that for me, you know? So, um, no, what a, uh, and I, we still email. I mean, I, I love the guy. So uh, let's talk about this book because it's understanding superhero comic books. Um, it's, it seems like it's a labor of love for you, the time and effort that you've put into it. Give us a, an overview of, of what brought this all together. Yeah. So, um, basically when I started all the studying of, so I, I bought a lot of books on comic history and I just kind of read them and I just went through a bunch of them, um, from fanographics and, you know, newspaper strip reprints, whatever. It was after the strength of history of volumes where they kind of show you all the stuff that this, all this came from. So, I, and, uh, it was probably like five years of just studying, you know? Um, and, uh, then if I came up with, came upon something cool, you know, I'd post it in the Facebook group as a little post. Then if maybe 10 to 15 posts, you know, came together, came together as a theme, then I would go and make a YouTube video about it, you know, cause I was a film minor in college. And so I kind of always liked doing stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, and then I started kind of doing that. And then I started looking at all the videos and all the little articles I wrote on the website. And then I was like, you know, this, there's a theme overall. And then that's what started. Um, the book is really getting it and really digging into that stuff, actually going back over again, which was kind of hard uh, and making kind of an overall, you know, statement on mm -hmm. all the, all the information and in one linear way of approaching it and putting it all in a, in a bigger picture. And uh, so that's what kind of went into that. And then I had a first draft, which was horrible. <laughs> then uh, luckily from the publisher, they saw something, in, they were like, you know, we like where you're going with this, but you're going to, you know, you're going to need some help. I mean, you're going to need to like, you got to, you know, put this in a proper format, whatever. So then my friend uh, and Scott Robinson, PhD, he, he's a music uh, studies professor but he also does international comic studies and i was like look could you just kind of be my editor and kind of like you know so he taught me about you know chicago style format he uh he taught me about you know a thesis and how to write it you know he went through the first like chapter two with me and he was like look here's you have to relate all this into an overarching thing and uh so then i went back and you know his voice was just in my head like Every time I would do something, his voice, I would be like, what would he think of it? So I kind of then rewrote it. And then he went back. He's okay, this. All right. And then he just tightened up this chapter, that chapter. I'm like, he sent me back, you know, to work. It turned into like a thesis paper and he was my professor. It was pretty cool. Although uh, it, it was interesting because I, I had all that information in my head, but he kind of taught me to put it together, like through an academic, you know, format, uh, and it was very, it was very good. It was very, he was very influential in making it as nice as I feel like it turned out. Uh, and uh, yeah, and overall, the overall process is, you know, the origin of the of the comic book, the superhero, mm -hmm. and then how that gradually evolves over time, and who are the key figures who did that, and how did they do that, and uh, and what are some of the controversies and good, good and bad that comes with it. Um, and uh, so yeah, that's how it kind of turned about, and. I think also one of the interesting things I kind of figured the um, the stages of the superhero comic book development over time kind of mimics in a way the stages of human degradation, and I say that you know in a cool in a, that it's a, that it's cool that it does that. Uh, mm -hmm. It starts out idealistic, and then it becomes more relatable in the fifties, you know, with the science fiction stuff. Um, then it becomes more kind of flawed and realistic with that kind of Stanley Kirby Ditko stuff. And then there's an introduction of death, you know, where there's a fear of death now introduced. And then uh, and then with after that fear of death, then comes a certain selfishness with like the Alan Moore era of the superhero selfish figure. And so kind of this the stages of 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 human degradation, like from idealism to selfishness and all the stuff that happens and how fear of death kind of precedes selfishness, like all that kind of made sense to me. So that's kind of the overarching arc of the whole thing. And that's how I kind of organize it all. Who are some folks in this process of, of creating superheroes that you think the public should know about that they may not know about? 
Well, you know, I go through quite a bit of like some golden age guys, you know, and how they left, you know, like Mac Raboy and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Will Eisner, I don't think is necessarily, he's known in, you know, right. in comic world, but I think maybe the average mainstream person doesn't really know. Um, and, you know, a lot of the contemporaries like Reed Crandall and who, uh, you know, more people should know about. So there's quite a on those kind of golden age guys. And then also just kind of the specifics, you know, Julia Schwartz, I think, I don't know, does the average person who watches the flash TV show, do they know that Julia Schwartz is like responsible for, for all that, for the way that turned out? Um, you know, I don't know if they do that. I don't know if they do know that. And uh, I think that's important, you know, to, and uh, what is it exactly that, you know, Stan Lee and Jack Kirby and Steve Ditko brought that made that stuff, as good as it was, you know, I think it's it's not right to say that Stan Lee didn't do anything and that those guys created it all. Although I think they're truly more of the pioneering creators. But I think Stan had a certain editorial edict to be like, well, we got to still make this fit into the real world somehow. We can't just have these idealized space gods and, you know, character, you know, and not have a real world to 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 ground them in. And, and I think that was important. And and I think it's weird. Stan almost gets too much credit by some people and not, not enough credit by other people. I feel like it's important to straighten that out, uh, that he should, that, that, that what he did was important, um, for specific reasons. And then also, you know, Jim Starlin, I think we, a lot of us have read Jim Starlin comics. We love that stuff. I mean, the whole MCU is based on his stuff, but I don't know if anyone has really quite put him to, you know, those silver age guys as being so as being as important because he is uh with you know um jerry siegel joe schuster and uh you know julia schwartz and stan lee and kirby and starlin needs to be you know neck to neck with the that fear of death that he brought to his comics was huge i mean he created the death cosmic entity in marvel i mean that was a big deal and uh and then also and then and then alan moore also goes there you know for what he did and people would argue like maybe that wasn't a positive effect on comics, but it 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 is part of what made comics the modern they became. And that and that's important to kind of put all those guys in linear order. Also, John Byrne is also part of that, but not because of the stages of degradation, but because he was that one guy that can look at that old stuff and remodernize it for for a whole new Gen X generation X. And that's super important success followed him in to different comics it wasn't like we do one comic book and that was his x-men his fantastic four um his uh you know hulk his superman um all, all that stuff was record setting at the time and all of us kids love that stuff and um you know some people try to you know some of the people who grew up on the mort weisinger era of superman you know may not like him as much but in the 80s that's not who was driven by it was driven by and uh that was that's important that john Byrne gets put there as a person that successfully showed that if you can remodernize the old stuff you know you're a marketable guy and uh everyone wants you in the world of superhero comic books i think that's important these what do you see as the future of comics are there changes are there new steps coming do you think from with these new writers and artists out there or you think it's going to stay with what this like you said the five uh points and then it's just going to keep building off of that yeah good point i mean i think you know in the 90s it was kind of that extreme age where they kind of just used a lot of those former things but they just kind of went really intense with it mm -hmm. and then now it's kind of the movie age where um everything is linked to like hollywood film and tv in some way either they're writing it with hopes to become a, a film and tv streaming thing mm -hmm. or movie theater thing or they're or they're working for a company that's producing material to eventually do that anyway. So, you know, are we going to, so that's what I mean is that material then doesn't necessarily develop more. It just kind of does rearranges that old, older thing. Um, mm -hmm. And then does it. So then it's like, now you do that in the movies and TV and try to, and now they're starting to kind of, you know, we'll see if they, you know, if a, if a new frontier is reached, um, you know, I, I, I'm not sure if I've seen that happen yet. Right. And uh, I'd like to think I, I keep up on some of the new stuff, too. I, I can't necessarily say 
I, I love all the new stuff that Marvel does. I mean, I love most of it. Like I love Spider-Man. I love Guardians of the Galaxy. But I can't necessarily say that um, there's a new dimension being added to it. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, like like those aforementioned names. I can't necessarily say it's a new dimension. I can say it's more of that John Byrne approach of it, of modernize the old thing to keep mm -hmm. it relevant in the marketplace because that's what they're being paid to do. So I think it's more along those lines. Uh, so, and I think also there was a bit more of an illusion back then that if you can modern, if you can actually bring something original to it, um, well, the company's probably going to take it from you anyway. But back then, there was less of that. Uh, there was less of that um, jadedness about that, I think. But I think now people are thinking, well, if I'm going to do something new, I'm going to do it for like image or something where I keep the copyright. So I think that it's not just lack of imagination; it's also lack of motivation and lack of. Uh, um, you know, to really do it like those, you know, those previous people did to, mm -hmm. to create this era that everyone's kind of, the industry basically thrives off of, you right. know. And something you mentioned before about all those creators is that they all had long runs on books. They'll be on a book two, three years, if not more, and really build a whole universe around it. It seems now, like you also mentioned, folks are doing a smaller story, hoping that it gets picked up by someone, but there's no one who's going to be on a book for three, four years building creating either an artist or a writer do you think that's having an effect on i guess the, the the direction of comics nowadays well yeah i think so because what what tends to happen i think i'm not sure if there's there there might be some corporate decision behind this but i think when chris claremont became so associated with that x-men title after 16 15 years I think there was some editorial, you know, job that happened where they said, well, we want to kind of have X-Men do what Marvel wants and not necessarily what Chris Claremont wants. And that was part of that decision of, and also there were those new guys that eventually formed image coming in where they, they were really coming, hopping onto that popularity bandwagon, but there was a bit of a power play there to make it where it's not, let's make it Marvel's X-Men. And, and I think at some point, um, I don't know if writers are really like, even able to stay on a book that long anymore because I think they're shuffled around, you know, from, from thing to thing. Um, Jason Aaron did a great run on Thor though. I was, I was really impressed with, with what he did, but um, I think overall they're, they're shuffled uh, a bit. And uh, so you, you can't really quite do what Chris Claremont did again. And I think in a way there might be, there might be corporate reasons where they, they want the, they want the company to decide what those um what those characters do not necessarily the writer and i think even back then you know chris claremont could write a script do whatever i think now there's editorial camps and they all have to like get together and they all have to agree on a plan and move forward there's a lot more uh that whole 70s era where starlin was doing whatever he wanted with warlock you know i don't think that stuff happens anymore do you have in your mind a blueprint of what a superhero should be? Are there certain characteristics that this he or she needs to have in order to become a superhero? Well, um, the definition of a superhero, which is what my uh, friend Pete Coogan wrote his book on in 2007, and he uses the definition, and I use that definition in my book, is there's there's three basic qualities, which I call, I call the standard superhero. Like, like it's kind of a the lame idealistic one that no one really cares about, but you need those three things, um, which I do agree on. In and that's uh, a superpower or super ability, a costume code name, and some sort of mission for justice. Like you have to, there has to be something selfless in it, um, mm -hmm. where they're where they're looking out for other people. So those three basic qualities must exist for it to be a, a superhero. And you know, there's always little wiggle room around that, um, but I think it's mostly those three, and then. And now if you, but that's, you know, a 1940 superhero and that's, you know, the first that's Superman and it's a very basic character. And I think one of the reasons which I put in the book on why the superheroes kind of ran out of style, some of it was because of, it was the end of the war and people didn't need escapism, but also just wasn't realistic enough for people to really hang on to for that long. I think people were like, well, this is kind of dry stuff, you know, let the, let the five-year-olds read it. And then adults <laughs> wanted other genres. They wanted crime comics and, you know, romance and, war story so they wanted something more um i think what 
what happened though as the superhero evolved because of guys like Schwartz and and Lee and and Starlin and whatever is that they started implementing some of the fears and relatability factors that those other genres had. So, you know, they employed romance. Uh, if you look at, you know, the Jack Kirby helped pioneer romance and and Stanley did quite a bit of work on romance so that whole, you know, the love triangles of the 60s Marvel was like that was all over the place. Mm-hmm. You know, um I think they even tried to make one with Professor X and Jean Grey and Scott at one point where in one panel, right? Where uh, Professor X was like, oh yes, my one true love. And then they never went back because I was totally creepy. But um, <laughs> but they were throwing that into whatever, you know, the romance genre, they were mm-hmm. throwing that into it. And then, um, uh, and, you know, just implementing, you know, even crime, you know, have have gangsters in it, throw the kingpin in there, you know, throw throw other genres in and make it more realistic and make it so i think for to answer the question to make it a successful superhero you do need the um you do need other genres and other things and you need the relatable factors to make it interesting and compelling and relatable so people of all ages could read it not just not just a five-year-old and the five-year-olds really aren't necessarily looking at comics they're looking at you know the ipad and other things they're not so you have to be able to attract as many people as you can. And so by utilizing, you know, the relatability, the 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 flaws, um, the fear of death, the selfishness, if you can get all that in, um, then uh, and then also use other genre materials. You know, the reason why Logan was so successful, that movie was because it was a Western, you know, with mutant powers. And so if you can kind of uh, utilize those factors and then also bring in other genres to mix it with, then I think that's more successful. But that's not necessarily pioneering. You're not creating, you're not pioneering, but you are reconfiguring um, old stuff to make it more modern when you do that. I want to jump to your historian uh, part as well, because it seems nowadays with things like Twitter and Facebook and social media, people are speaking on behalf of folks like Steve Ditko or Jack Kirby or other creators who are most likely born after these men had passed away. And saying, well, you know, this person, they they thought this and the reason they did this was this. Right. Is it frustrating when there's so much, I guess it would be, misinformation out there or opinions turned into, you know, facts about these people um, that might be changing the way folks think about them? Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure it is. Uh, one thing in my book I have is a lot of citations and... Uh, I think that was the one thing. I think I I, I counted them all. I have like twelve hundred citations at the end, and there, there's like thirty pages of citations. and And I think the what was important for that is everything I wrote. I was like, I should probably look at this, find the source of this. And I actually debunked like four things of my own in my own head, you know. And I was like, okay, so I was wrong about that, uh, you know. Like there's some things about Joe Simon and Jack Kirby and and the nature of, um them leaving um timely to go to dc or what i i call it dc it had a few names but i call it dc um you know some people say oh yeah stan ratted them out and and i believe that but joe simon doesn't even think that's what happened so it's like well if he doesn't think that's what happened then you know should we think that that's what happened uh so you know there are just certain things um that i was like gosh okay so i can't necessarily and so i see that a lot um I was that way. Uh, I, I have to admit, uh, I was before. Um, I, I'm not. I think there are stages to this, um, to this historian thing, and and I'm not at the very top in my head yet. You know, I think it's like Jedi Academy or whatever. <laughs> I mean, you there are stages here, and uh, um, I think, you know, and I think we all start out as fans, and then I think eventually we start becoming history enthusiasts, and and I think with the history enthusiasm. But still, fandom, you you will almost take other people's word who weren't there at face value and just believe it. And you know, you got to work past that. And then you have to kind of just read as many interviews and not just interviews, but also just books on the subject that have been published, that have been peer reviewed by other people. And then you start having, I think it's it's a more refined, I don't know what I want to say refined. Just, there's just more nuance to it. And one of the things that really helped me was like, with Ditko, because I'm a big Ditko guy, was hanging out with the fam- Ditko family, you know, mm-hmm. going over there and, hey, uh, you know, talking to, you know, his nephews and, uh, you know, learning more about 
Steve, in that sense. And that was huge for me, actually going to Pennsylvania, where mm -hmm. where he lived and driving around and then looking at the house he grew up in and then talking with them and kind of understanding it, it that helped me a lot. Um, you know, that it's interesting and interviews are important too, but it's also like going to some of the places where these people were and you get a kind of sense and, and that's not always easy to do. Um, mm -hmm. but that Didco convention that they had gave me the perfect reason to go and do that. And, um, yeah. And so then, you know, you run into people saying these things, uh, online and you know you just do you want to get into an argument you know do you and i think at at some point what i feel is the most useful is if you can get like a like a like a quote or from something that might just that'll probably say something different and say look well according to this source this is what i'm seeing do you have another source that that says something i'd love to see it you know right. and you know if they if you can try to come across that in a, in a genuine way like they might they might have a source that you mm -hmm. just haven't seen before and you remain open to that then i hope it comes off you know as just as a curious question not it, you have to be careful about sounding too authoritative um because then people get combative and defensive and you know it's social media no one can see each other's eyes and right. it's all just word it's like text message fighting you know <laughs> So you just want to, you have to be, you have to be a little careful. And um, sometimes, you know, you just roll past it. You know, it's like, I just don't have time to. So, yeah. So sometimes, yeah, sure. I mean, you, I'm sure you've run into that yourself. You, you've you asked uh, different creators, different questions and you hear what they have to say. And sometimes it's different from what fans just might casually think. And you just kind of, you know, you just kind of do, you know, you don't want to start fights either. So it's right. a bit of a, it's a push and a pull. Mm -hmm. What I really love about what you do is, it's these really deep dives with the with the guests that you have. And it's not just people, you know, writers and artists and stuff like that, but it's people in the comic industry themselves. Like I said, you know, you spoke to Bud Plant. You speak to a lot of yeah. folks who helped make comics what they are, whether they're drawing or writing or just, you know, right. being part of selling comics who, yeah, and stuff yeah. like that. Why I is think, it so I important? Think, I think, yeah, right, go ahead, finish, yeah. I would just say, why is it so important for you to, to do such a full-scale look at the world of yeah. comics i think some people you know i think sometimes it's easy to reduce comics to just the artist and the artists are huge you can't do without them it's a visual thing but it's a commercial art the whole thing is a commercial art and so there's commerce involved and it's a business and it doesn't survive without people wanting to buy it and so the business part of it is always really interesting to me like i i, I tend to ask a lot of questions about the business aspect. Like, why did this stop? Or why did that cease publication? Mm -hmm. Why, how did that run out of money? You know, I, I like knowing that stuff. Uh, the, the visual part is obviously important, but then there's, and the writing part, we all want to know what's going to happen next. So the writers are super important. A lot of people know that, you know, Scott Snyder's like a celebrity with Batman. I mean, so, and he deserves to be right, rightfully so, you know, but then the editors, you know, you don't really, that that's, that's really important because they have to kind of do this quality control. They be, you know, you can't really do that. And there are some, you know, there's some amazing writers, but they come up with some wacky idea. And then the editor is like, oh, we can't do that. And, uh, and then how they choose who writes what and uh, how that's going to sell and how that's going to deal with the corporate people upstairs. There's so many factors behind this that, and they all come together into that one thing you're holding, you know, mm -hmm. it has, the art and the writing and you see the credits, but then you see a price tag that, that all means something, you know, there it's a commercial art and it's a, it's a, very, you have to, I think is important to look at it holistically. Um, you know, how does that, how does that flow? How does that money flow? And that's, I think, interesting uh, mm -hmm. because without the the money, no one's gonna, it, it stops. You're a comic fan like we are. Was there ever an interview or a guest that you had where you just kind of pinched yourself and said, I can't believe I'm actually speaking to so-and-so? Yeah. Um, well, that happened with Steranko for sure. I was going to say, that's a pretty and big then, one to start with. And then um, and then Neil Adams, you know, when Bill and I interviewed him at, at Comic-Con, that was that was big. That was that was what actually kind of gave me the gusto to kind of think, OK, I could approach Steranko now was after <laughs> Neil Adams. Uh, and Neil was so nice. Uh, he was so nice. uh really kind when i brought up you know how the howard howard no strand and the the studios that he worked in in like mm -hmm. the 50s uh, he was like who are you you know and then he was so nice after that that um so 
yeah so those two were like big and then after that you know i was just i think after that it was more it, it turned into more of like a mission you know um especially after the strength one it all became a real mission to to talk to people and that disbelief started to go away to more just um inqu inquisitiveness it was more like this constant inquisitiveness that never that never left and mm -hmm. uh I would say, you know, um, when you, the the book, I would say um, after putting all the detail into that, you know, I think energy wise, you know, I kind of needed like a six month break or something, you know, after that, because I was like, whoa, that was hard, a lot harder than I expected. But I I'm glad I did it. But um, yeah, it but uh, no, it was this kind of it, it felt like a mission at that point. And mm -hmm. I think once it became a mission, um, it was very uh, much more you know, um, question driven and not necessarily the starstruck part started to kind of go away. Um, mm. but I, I, I do love, you know, the, the different people that were, you know, really nice enough to, you know, come on the show and, and hang out for as long as they did too. It's not just, you know, some of them don't have much time, but some people, you know, like, the strength one was only supposed to be like 20 minutes, <laughs> but we were in his hotel room at like 3 a.m. and and I just kept asking and I kept asking and and he wanted to make sure the story that he got the story straight. So then it just started turning to this thing that so I think I, I'm I'm grateful when um, they're nice enough to do it for that long, uh, mm -hmm. too, because not everyone has that time, you know, um, to just sit there and do that and go deep. But I think, you know, if I think and I hope and at least with the generation that I'm talking about, and I think I'm talking about more like the. Uh, the baby boomers and the silent generation before, because, you know, we did Frank Thorne also that one time and he was, he was pretty, he was like 90 at the time. Mm -hmm. um, I think that in that era of, of creators, if there's a true, like um, if there's a true sense, like this person is genuinely curious, they've done their homework and wow, this guy like knows these funny little details. I think then they, there is a, wanting to and they do want to kind of do it and they do want mm -hmm. to kind of be there and this guy put in the time you know um you know now nowadays you know with i think younger younger creators you know that are more our age uh, i think there's only so much time to go around and they're also working still they're working now they're not retired so i think at that point when you're working and you got your cell phone with like 10 different texts going off uh, you know they might not necessarily have the same kind of time you know, to sit there for four to eight hours or whatever. But, uh, uh, but um, I, I'm glad, but I'm grateful uh, for that. Also, the whole silent generation of guys, um, you know, my friend David Armstrong, kind of a kindred spirit, he was doing all these interviews um, with people like with, you know, a nice set at, at conventions for like, you know, 15 years when they were all alive, like, uh, you know, John Remy, well, John Remy is senior still alive, but John Buscema, and you know lily renee and all these people and he you know i talked to him about it and we're buddies you know and he's kind of my film guru because he he was a senior vp at mgm but he's like look i got all these interviews do you want to like remaster them and edit them and put them on the channel i'm like yes you know and uh and that was that was a big deal because it was after i just turned in the book to the publisher and i'd been activated on who all these people were but then actually sitting there and looking at like, you know, 50 minutes of interview and editing it and finding the art and putting it on. And it, 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 it all became quite real. Like these people, these people built the industry that we're all just so hung up on right now. And, um, and that was a big deal too, just editing and remastering David's interviews of these people that are mostly gone. Um, so yeah, the, that was really that was really nice and then also every weekend i'd have a new one that i just finished inter editing and i would call him up i'd be okay tell me about that interview this person seemed kind of like this that and they're just great you know and he was he, be, he became a mentor to me through all that um but yeah so it was been real positive stuff and me and him actually he was a big stranko fan and he met he dressed up as captain america at a 1965 convention and where he met and he met Storenko that year in 1965. And so me and him went to that Storenko uh, museum that happened for a little while there. Mm -hmm. uh, me, Storenko and him just had so much fun, like hanging out till like three in the morning. And wow. it was just, uh, so yeah, just, just good. Uh, very, I'm just very, I'm very grateful, you know, for the the nice people that I've met.
through all this, including you. I, we wouldn't have met if it wasn't for comics and right. the love for it and wanted to find out more about it, you know? So it's great. Are you surprised, uh, pleasantly surprised, how well comic book historians is doing because it's so, so many people want to hear these stories from these folks to hear about how all this came together um well yeah i think i think so you know it's interesting i don't necessarily look at the reception part as much as and i you know i i, I never want to feel um you know like I never want to feel settled. So I just kind of um, keep working, I guess, but right. I, I am, but if, but you know, if there is, um, I, I look at the views and I look at, you know, the, the average view duration, you know, on the, on the analytics. So I can kind of get a sense. And when I see that it's a, it's a high number of views and that the view duration is high. Um, yeah, that, that, those numbers do. I'm, I'm very glad about that. Now, if that has an, an emotional, um satisfaction to a viewer that really is 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 wonderful but i don't necessarily hear that so much because um i don't know if you know i, I guess i see some comments occasionally but i guess i don't hear it so it, it's not as real to me um but but I, I hope that exists um you know i hope that exists do you have any white whales of guests that you've been wanting for years and it just keeps getting out of the way <laughs> um well i you know uh, i would say that um uh, i don't know if that i don't know if that would be the not necessarily um you know i think the i i can't necessarily say that no i would i would say that um uh there's some people that actually that are white whales that we've already agreed to do it, but I just haven't found time yet to actually, hey, like say, okay, let's do it here. So I, I'm still looking into like scheduling, mm -hmm. um, uh, but uh, I haven't seen, I, I haven't necessarily felt like I couldn't do something, gotcha. but um, you know, I don't know. Do you, do you feel that way? Uh, oh, there are certain folks that we would love to get that, you know, it's trying to find contacts or, you know, their time or interests and stuff like that. And and some folks uh, are just sort of off the grid. So you have to kind of yeah. roll with that. But uh, like you said before, the, the folks we have spoken to, you know, I know for us and I, I'm sure for you, they're not getting paid to sit and talk yeah. to us. Right. They're, they're taking time out of their days to sit and talk with us. And it's such an honor that they would you know, find the time to do that. Oh yeah, totally. I, that's what I'm saying is, uh, th there's something really kind about that mm -hmm. generation. I almost think because, yeah. um, I think that there are some younger ones that they'd be like, look, is he paying me, you know, a thousand bucks now? Then screw it. I'm not good. You know, there's a bit of that, you know, callous right. price tag, uh, with some of the, some people. And, but no, um, that's what I mean is I think there's something really kind about, these people um and also i think right now there's just more of a forum to be able to do that and some of them do want to get some stories straight and want to make sure like hey look i want to make sure history gets this right and so it's nice when that lines up you know right. when they there's something they want to straighten out and then you're offering that to to them to get that out there and uh so that's that's great when that lines up too um uh really really nice uh fellow uh larry hama he we uh that that happened right after like the day that Neil Neil Adams passed away. So it was interesting. I think there was something um nice for both of us in doing that because I really like Neil. He worked with Neil for like years and knew him for years. So whole nother level of relationship. But there was like a nice connection during that particular interview where we were both sad about what had just happened and how um, you know, we could talk a bit about Neil and then also about his career. So there's some that actually stand out as interesting emotional markers in time like mm -hmm. that. Um, uh, so yeah, um, no, yeah, that, um, you know. So what's the plans for the book? Are you going to go on tour? Are you going to go to conventions and talk to yeah, fans? So the, the publisher has like a list of conventions they go to. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, so there's one that I was thinking of going to dragon con, which is uh, 
I've always wanted to go. So I might, I'll probably do that. Um, they have a, they have a list and, you know, it kind of has to line up with, with time, you know, I work. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I, I've already started with the, uh, kind of the online, you know, social media promotions and stuff. So I've, I'm definitely doing that. And, uh, then, um, you know, also, uh, as far as doing panels and at conventions with that being part of the, you know, part of the identification of who I am. Oh, I'm the writer of that, you know? Um, but then also, uh, showing up looking at that list from the publisher, cause they set up a whole thing. And, um, so that's going to be, it'll be interesting to experience that. Cause I've never, I haven't experienced anything like that before. Um, I've self-published a few things. Um, and, uh, that's different because, you know, the responsibility is on me. This is interesting because the publisher is completely in control of a lot of that stuff, although it is incumbent on the author also to promote it and, you know, do what they can to get the word out. So, which I, which I am, uh, but, um, and thank you for having me on to talk about it as well. That's really um, nice. Do you see more books in the future? Um, <laughs> so this book, I mean, when you see it and, um, I'll send you a copy, uh, but, but you'll see, you'll look at it. You'll be like, wow, this is, this is a lot of work. This was a lot of work. I mean, this was a lot of work. I mean, it's, um, I think it's like 350 pages and it's like, a. I think it's, um, like a hundred and 140,000 words. I mean, it's not, it's, it's. What well, it was the first version I was telling you about. There was a lot of pictures, like nine hundred pictures of the, and the editor was like, "Look, we love it, but look, we're we can't publish that many pictures. You're gonna have to write a lot of that." <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> "I was like, all right, uh, I'm ready to do it." So that whole rewriting and then you know, and having the my editor kind of, kind of, um, he went he went Mr. Miyagi on me. I was like the Karate Kid and <laughs> um, really hashing it all out and really putting that into words, like more formal words and. Um, it was a process. So would I do one of those again? I don't know. I think I might, uh, um, there's a few things that I do plan on making, you know, I I've made a couple of graphic novels, um, mm -hmm. Hashman, which I just did with my friend, Josh Berman, um, mm -hmm. which is a, a, a biography of this really nutty character in the marijuana world of, of, of the past 50 years. And, uh, then journey to Mexico, which was like, uh, my own little fantasy story about, uh, an 1830s Mexican superhero. Um, but the, I'm working on another one right now. And so graphic novel, yes, like I'll def, because that's different. There's something more creative and fun. You know, writing a history book is like, whew, I mean, it's, um, this is, a, you know, I'd like to think it's like a textbook level, you know, book on this material. And uh, so what, uh, so it depends. Definitely graphic novel, um, definitely some zines that I plan on doing um, from the comic book historian viewpoint. Um, but uh, another history book, you know, I don't have that in my mind yet, but maybe in another 10 years, maybe I'll do like the sequel, which would be what happens after. But, um, you know, let let some more time pass by first, I guess. Makes sense. Now, one last question I wanted to ask you and, you, and you just brought it up because you are a part of it. It's it's the boom of independent comics. Yeah. How do you think, you know, things like Kickstarter and, and the yeah. GoFundMes and stuff, uh -huh. How do you think that's changing the comic landscape? And do you see this as a long-term thing in the history of comics? Or do you think this is something that's come out of maybe the COVID era and it has sort of a shelf life to it? Well, you know, a lot of this is kind of like what's happening with the film industry as well, where, you know, we can't necessarily expect the major studios to really pop out stuff that's just going to sell in movie theaters anymore. Right. So it's reorienting into like these five streaming channels now. Um, you know, it used to be five TV networks, then it became this other stuff, cable, and now it's five streaming channels. So it's weird that it's made that journey. Uh, but, you know, uh, if you have a an agent or you have a film distributor, you, you could make your own indie thing and then, and if it's good enough to pass a certain level of ex ex inspection, you can mm -hmm. get that stuff on all the streaming apps. So this is kind of like what's happening with comics in a way, you know, will, will comics stay profitable? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, at least not like it was in the eighties. I mean, in nineties, that was crazy. Right. Uh, 
But internet has changed all of this, all of entertainment. And so, you know, you, you, you look at, um, the the Marvel the Disney Disney's like that lifeline to Marvel of like the MCU and that feeding they they feed each other a bit I, I think that but I I don't know how how much longevity that even has and I think in a sense the market gets diluted because there's so many small publishers now going through easier venues to like print on demand and not have to make a whole print run and not have to go through Diamond and um, I, I think what that's, what that also has done is all those smaller publishers also can't just make a bunch of money either. Uh, and now it's like the whole thing becomes more to me anyway, it seems like a labor of love more so than, uh, necessarily this like get rich quick thing. I think the Kickstarter thing certainly helps if you've already worked in a, in a fan base, uh, market like the big two and you've developed fans from that and then you go on kickstarter and do your thing that i could see because those fans want to keep seeing more of what you did to spider-man yeah do it to your own guy well sure well i think you know but if you haven't had that um it's hard to do a kickstarter and people don't know you know who you are in that sense at least from that mainstream co consumer comic book market so um it, it leads to a lot of like these you know indie things where they do it as print on demand and if you know the right ways to do it you know you can get it on barnes and noble and other places you don't necessarily need um, a big publisher to do all that stuff for you. But um, so will that, will it continue to get more? Yeah, I think it will. I think it'll just get more like that and less of like, let's say Marvel and DC may eventually f not make any more money and their parent companies may say, well, what's the point now? Mm -hmm. And then suddenly you just have a bunch of people not making very much money, but each one putting out their own comics if they like it enough. Right. And uh and then you have like these kind of more smaller production outfits making films for Netflix and other venues and Hulu. Mm -hmm. And so it's going to be more like smaller parties getting together, creating this content and then putting it on a streaming app while you can also then get it. So the internet is really, it's in a way it's leveling the playing field, but not necessarily in a good way, in a way that people will actually make less money mm -hmm. than they were, I think. Um, but there'll be more expression and less, you know, editors telling you what to do, but there will also be, you know, I think it's going to be more of a labor of love, I think. But again, mm -hmm. I'm talking 20, 30 years. I'm not, I'm not really sure, you know? Right. Um, I mean, how old are you? 45. Yeah. So I'm 40, I'm 44. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it, like a lot of collectibles, aren't they kind of driven by, by guys our age? I mean, exactly. So buying like our happened? old collections back. Yeah. So, you know, what happens when that goes away, you know, uh, at least from the buyer's market? Um, mm -hmm. You know, I don't know, you know, what, what happens to all that stuff? And what is that? What happens to popular culture? And what happens to this uh, commercial art that's supposed to be this, this cheap consumer cons consumable um, entertainment that then becomes more and more expensive because less people are buying it. Right. Um, I think it, it, it all starts. I think the print on demand model just starts to just make sense. Um, or just digital or electronic reading because I don't know. It's like, I can't, I don't even know if I can even buy another comic book and fit it in my library. So it's like digital just becomes easier. So mm -hmm. I don't know, you know, these are all things that just kind of go toward, I think, indie publishing more and more, but not necessarily in a way that, you know, um, everyone just makes a bunch of money. I, I don't right. I think it's going to be more just expressing something. And if it catches, it catches. If it doesn't, it doesn't. And then the Kickstarter thing works because the big two veterans are out there doing that stuff. But when that starts to kind of fade away, then then what happens to that? You know, I think it just becomes indie publishers after a while. But I don't know. We'll see. So makes sense to me. Uh, when does the book come out? Where can folks get the book? OK, so uh, it'll be everywhere Jan uh, June 16th. So that's okay. about five weeks from now. Mm -hmm. um, I see it already for pre-order on all the you know, like Target and, you know, Barnes mm -hmm. and Noble and whatever, Amazon, it's there for pre-order now. Um, so you can pre-order in all those places, but it'll become available June 16th. Um, it'll already pretty much be in all the libraries uh, pretty fast. And then I think it just depends on the catalog from the publisher 
and you know what books that each you know book dealer looks at a publisher's catalog and they order it for their bookstores you know we see that process and how that works so so we'll i'll find out if i can just get it if i can walk into a place and get it but um right now it's all available for pre-order at all the at all the websites for all those book dealers and so that's that guys uh great interview alex thank you so much for taking the time i would love to have you back on just to talk about the world of comics and everything else that's going on uh as i said before check out his book uh when it comes out it's going to be something that every comic fan and, and collector and historian really wants to get their hands on uh he's done so much hard work for it and it's so great to hear his insights and his thoughts on older comics and the state of comics today so alex thank you again and thank you guys again for listening checking us out Please be sure to rate, review, subscribe, tell your friends, and we will see you next time.